at the tone. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll give everyone just a few more minutes to uh, join us. Uh, I know a lot of people tend to dial in right at the hour. So I'll start a quick video to start with, and then we'll get going with the webinar. Do you know what's changing in your pipeline week over week? Are you struggling to know which deals will close as you try to make your quota and forecast number? HD Forecast from Inside Sales allows you to zero in on what's changed in your pipeline, spot risk, and deliver bulletproof forecasts. It reduces the time you spend forecasting so you can spend more time making sales. HD Forecast, part of the InsideSales.com platform, drives more revenue by increasing your time to sell, doubling your forecast accuracy, and improving close rates by up to 20%. See how HD Forecast can help you mitigate your pipeline risk to sell more and improve your forecast accuracy. All right, we're about two minutes after, so we'll go ahead and get started. This is a quick overview of how the webinar is going to work. It's going to be about 35 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Type your questions in the Q&A box as you think of them. We'll answer them in the middle of the presentation if appropriate, or at the very end if that's appropriate. Um, use the uh, hashtag Inside Sales Webinar and uh, continue the conversations there. And then, of course, this will be recorded. We'll share out the link as well as uh, some uh, additional piece of content that you'll be able to access and leverage. I'd like to first introduce, uh, there's going to be two speakers, myself actually, Ivan Hurt, but most importantly, the primary speaker here today is Dana Terrian. He is a senior analyst at, at Serious Decisions and has done some fantastic work around forecasting, what organizations need to do to improve the quality of their forecasting, and how really to move the ball forward. So with that, I'd like to turn the time over to Dana. Thank you very much, Ivan. I appreciate it. Um, so just before I get started, a little bit about Serious Decisions. We're a research and advisory firm that focuses on helping uh, companies focus on B2B sales with sales, marketing, and product alignment. And I'm one of the research directors in their sales operations strategies group, and I focus on, on sales operations and sales-related issues. And I've spent a lot of time over the last year doing some research on forecasting, and it fits in nicely to what uh, Inside Sales does, especially with their, uh, their acquisition of a forecasting tool within the last couple of years. Um, when you think about forecasting and some of the issues that companies have, the number one issue is that there's an over-reliance on intuition. So when you rely on salespeople to, to produce their forecast week over week and sales leadership all the way up the chain, there's a couple of errors that they make. The first one is that just innately salespeople and sales in general is, is overly optimistic and they have a tendency to focus only on the positive events and, and just by nature overlook some of the negative ones. So innately, and it's not just a, a problem that's unique to sales, but to any kind of forecasting in general, is that when you overlook these negative events, then you produce a number that's generally not going to happen. And sometimes you can even underestimate um, the, the value of opportunities in pr producing forecasts. So the forecast will be exceeded by, by a number or it will be underachieved by a number. And the research that we've done, as you'll see in a second, is that most companies don't do a very good job, and there are some things that we can do to help you improve it. Um, the second issue is that we've often put salespeople in a position where we're asking them to lie about their forecast. And I know there are a lot of salespeople on the, on the line today. It seems a little strange that we would ask someone to lie about a forecast, but the way that we do it, and especially you know, being in sales operations for as long as I have, is on that initial forecast at the beginning of the forecast period, whether it's the quarter or the week or the month, uh, salespeople will come back with their most accurate forecast that they can determine given the information that they know. And if it doesn't meet what the expectation is, if it's below quota or if it's below plan, a frequent conversation is to say, that's just unacceptable. I need you to come back with a better number. And inevitably, they do come back with a better number that's closer to expectation, but it's quite often not one that they believe in. So those are the two real issues. The big issue is that there's an over-reliance on intuition, and then it's supported by these two ideals that exist within sales. 
So the way that we can help uh, improve it is to not over rely on intuition. Um, the other issues that we have is that when you over rely on intuition is that there are, uh, there's a lack of standard forecast processes within companies in general. Some companies are better than others, especially with a with Salesforce automation platforms and other tools that have become more available. We've seen great improvement over the years, but there's still a predominant number of companies that don't have a standardized forecast process and it's not supported by tools and technologies. And also many companies overlook funnel coverage ratios as a means to improve forecast accuracy, just as a basic predictive analytics tool that they could create and use for themselves and one that they can enhance with other tools in addition to Salesforce automation. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today is how to build an accurate forecast, accurate, an accurate forecast within your Salesforce automation platform, the elements that are required to have in place. And then also I'm going to talk about a forecast process that would be employed in addition to the tools and technology that you use. And then lastly, the whole idea around uh, tools and technology, especially around predictive analytics, is one that we encounter daily as we talk to our customers. I'm going to give you some tips and some ideas to consider when you're evaluating predictive analytics vendors and some things that you should look for. The idea of that forecast accuracy is, is important. It's pretty pervasive across uh, most B2B companies. Our research shows that on average companies spend two and a half hours per week per rep preparing forecast. And you would expect with so much effort that goes into it that the result would be generally pretty good. But our, our research shows that only 21% of companies are accurate within 10%. And the standard really is plus or minus 5%. So we're spending all this time to only achieve results that are within uh, an accuracy rate of, of plus or minus 10%. And the consequences to sales are all the ones that you see in the slide below. The, the greatest consequence is that sales loses credibility when they don't achieve their sales forecast. You know, granted, it's probably viewed more favorably when they overachieve their number, but still, the question always comes back to the sales leaders is, how did you not see that coming? So I'm going to talk about some ways to improve upon um, intuition, and then also I'm going to show you some tools that are going to help you spend less than two and a half hours per week and some processes. The first uh, thing I'd like to do is just ask you a question. What's, what's your forecast accuracy like inside of your organization? Is it plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10%? Are you inaccurate by more than 10%? Or have you just never used sales forecasting uh, before? So I'll give you a minute to answer, and then I'll move on to the results. Um, but as I'm doing that, I'll just ask Ivan, when you look at your companies, when do they generally involve you and ask for a forecasting solution, and how does their forecast accuracy look when you start talking to them? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, they're all over the place. We go to some organizations that really don't have any methodology at all. And one of the things they're looking for is what is the best practice around creating sales forecasts, even running a sales pipeline meeting. And then other organizations, they're just so complex. They're dealing with different um, – their, their geographies are changing, mid-forecasts. Um, they may have to deal with multiple types of currencies or other things like that. And so really it's a complexity problem. So they, they almost in, tend to be on one end or the other. Either they're very um, junior in trying to develop a much more rigorous forecasting process. So like you said, they're, they're not that 90% that aren't hitting their forecasts. Or they're so complex that they need simplification because the amount of headcount and resources that are being used to pull together that forecast is just, you know, it's just too burdensome. So it, it tends to be on both ends of the spectrum. That's exactly what we see, Ivan. And, and the, the customers that we talk to on a daily basis, many of them are trying to manage a process inside of Excel, outside of their Salesforce automation platform. So they're wasting time not just preparing forecasts, but also sales operations and trying to manipulate and understand the data. So let's see what yeah, the forecast uh, You so bring up a really is, good point. Yeah, you bring up a really good point. Well, w just one more thing there. Um, it really affects everyone, from the individual sales rep who is no longer out there trying to close more deals to the sales management, to the sales operations, and then, of course, into the CFO and, and, and that suite as well. So it's, it's a very wide, wide-impacting problem. 
and, and we see it as well. So I'm, I'm pleased to see that our, our the results that I see here are pretty much in line with the surveys that we've done over the years where, you know, around 21% of companies are accurate within plus or minus 10%. This this poll is telling us that it's more like 20, 25%. So uh, we, we did our survey a couple of years ago, and I'm just hoping that people are employing these solutions and just getting better at it. And a 5% improvement is, is pretty good or a five-point improvement. Um, but still, as you can see, most companies struggle with forecast accuracy with greater than 70%, just not uh, achieving within 10%. And, you know, 17 to 18% of companies, according to, to this, are, are not doing forecasting whatsoever. Let me just start talk, by talking about what the foundations of an accurate sales forecast are in your Salesforce automation platform. Now, this needs to be in place whether you're doing it in Excel or whether you're using the native functionality within your Salesforce platform or whether you're going to use a more advanced solution that's available to you through a third party. It starts with understanding the opportunity amount. So it's within the opportunity object within your Salesforce automation platform. You'd be surprised by how big of a debate this can be, especially for those companies that are making the transition from perpetual type licenses or hardware type sales to software as a service. Because it requires them to revalue how they view opportunities. With large hardware type deals, you've got large amounts of product, you know, sometimes millions of dollars, in addition to professional services and whatever other services are wrapped around selling that opportunity. When you move off to a, a subscription-based model, now you're starting to look at opportunity amounts that look more like committed contract value or annual contract value or total committed contract value. It's those companies in transitions are the ones that struggle with trying to value an opportunity. And also, we see many companies that are using an opportunity amount for their sales planning, and then they're using a different opportunity amount for their forecasting, and then they're using even a, a different opportunity amount for their compensation crediting. Best practice is to align all of those different opportunity amounts using the same methodology so that everybody's working off from the same number. So when a company's preparing a forecast, it's also going to affect the sales plan, and it's also going to affect their individual earnings. So spend some time understanding what the opportunity amount should be and work through that and get alignment on that before you even move forward. Next is sales stages. It's pretty common within any Salesforce automation platform that you have sales stages. Our research indicates that when your sales stages are mapped to a buyer's journey, when you're looking at your sales stages from the ups outside in, you tend to be more accurate in producing sales forecasts because now you're looking at a sales stage that's based upon where the customer is in their purchasing decision and making their purchasing decision rather than where the company is in trying to achieve internal metrics to, to close a, a deal through, through the different processes that, that, that are native to the company. So with sales stages, make sure that they're, they're simplified, make sure that they're mapped to the buyer's journey, and then also create some attributes that, re, that are required to be achieved before moving from one sales stage to another. So if the sales stage requires that a quote be produced, make sure that there's some sort of a way to check whether or not that's actually happened. And wherever possible, try to make the transition from one sales stage to another automated in the, in the process so that once these attributes are achieved, it just moves on naturally. One common problem in a sales process, in a forecasting process is that opportunities are mislabeled by sales stage. So that will help to solve that problem. Next is close date. The close date is just the date that the salesperson anticipates that the customer will make a purchasing decision. It's important that those be realistic and that they also align to what the sales stages are, as you'll see in a few minutes when I continue to go through the, the model. The last foundation is forecast category. Now, we recommend not overcomplicating this and also using multiple forecast categories that can sometimes conflict with one another. So our recommendation is that you just use standard forecast categories like pipeline, best case, commit, uh, you know, we've seen some pretty crazy forecast categories like blood commit or, um, you know, best case or best case uh, scenario in a, with some additional qualifiers on them. It just overcomplicates it. And also this idea around probabilities. Now, I know a lot of Salesforce automation platforms require a probability to be input in, into the opportunity itself. But as we said, salespeople are generally not great at predicting probabilities. Probabilities are something that should be used for sales operations at the highest levels. Uh, they can also be suggested for salespeople if it's a if it's a sales opportunity that's generally the same 
size for every single opportunity, like an SMB type sale. But when you start to get into enterprise sales where you have very large, chunky deals, applying a probability of closure at the sales uh, person's level or even at the sales manager's level is generally pretty inaccurate because with a large deal, it's either going to close or it's not going to close. It's not like you're going to get a percentage of that when it happens. So stick to simple forecast categories and try to avoid asking your salespeople to put probabilities in, into the, the system itself. Leave that to sales operations and to the people that have the algorithms to determine it and also the predictive solutions that will do it for you. So when you have these foundations in place, you can move on to forecast scenarios. The forecast scenarios are based upon the different uh, foundations and how they combine. So in this example, we've got the sales stages across the top, and then you map those to an opportunity amount. In the earlier sales stages, you'll see that the opportunity amount is generally just an estimate. As you progress, you'll see that it gets more accurate. So when you start to get into the qualify and identify sales stages, the, the forecast or the opportunity amount will get a little bit more accurate. And a lot of this is complemented through uh, configure price quote tools, other tools that will help in the configuration and the pricing and the quoting to make it more accurate so that it doesn't constantly change. But by the time you get to the later sales stages, you should have a pretty higher reliance on the accuracy. Now, a good forecasting tool will allow for sales managers and salespeople to input things, uh, some, something that many companies just call um, uh, judgment on top of it. So that allows for changes or, or difference in, in estimates on opportunity amounts based upon the salesperson's perception of it, based upon the sales leader's perception of it, and other factors that can be taken into account. Next, you combine that with close date. When you're managing forecast calls, you should start to look for exceptions based upon what your sales cycle is. So if you've got a longer sales cycle, like let's say six to eight months, and you've got an opportunity that's in either of these two earlier sales stages of educate or qualify, that's cause for inspection and a cause for question to ask the salesperson, well, why do you think that this opportunity is going to close within the next 90 days when our average sales cycle is really 60 to 90 days? So look for correlation between close date and sales stage, and then also just understand that the opportunity amount is going to be more accurate as you, as you go through the process. And finally, you overlay forecast category. Look for correlation between forecast category, close date, and sales stage. So if you've got something in a forecast category of commit and it's in a sales stage of qualify, that's cause for question. It could happen. It happens sometimes. Many Salesforce automation platforms require that there be default forecast categories by sales stage that can be overwritten. And they do that for a reason because there should be a pretty strong correlation between the later sales stages and the commit. So it will suggest to the salesperson that it should be a committed opportunity. Now, talking about predictive analytics, predictive analytics will go way beyond that, and we'll use the algorithms. We'll actually learn from the data that you have in your system that says, but based upon the firmographics of this company, what their purchasing history has been, and based upon the actions of this individual rep and how accurate they've been in the, in the, in the past, we're suggesting that this should be the forecast category for this opportunity. So they do it on an opportunity-by-opportunity opportunity basis. When you start to apply these forecast scenarios, now you, uh, you can, or when you start to use these different foundational elements, you can come up with forecast scenarios. So the three most common are the ones that I'll go through. The first one is most likely. And that's just saying, look, everything that's closed is going to, is going to, to close within the forecast period. Everything that we have committed and then a portion of what's in best case would, would make up your most likely scenario. Now, it's important that you have the ability to do some sort of what-if scenario, especially for sales operations leaders with senior sales leaders like CSOs, where you can move opportunities in and out based upon your individual inspection of these opportunities. So when you're looking at a forecasting tool, make sure there's some sort of what-if functionality that will allow you to move opportunities inside of a most likely scenario. Or a best-case scenario, which would be everything that's in most likely Dana, it looks like we may have lost your audio. My apologies for the attendees. Let's just give it one more second to see if this audio comes back in. Let's see. 
He's just getting to the sexiest part of his presentation, so we want to try and get him back in and see if we can get his audio on. Let's see. All right, we are trying to get him back up online now. Just give us one more second. My apology for the technical difficulty. I apologize for that. I, I seem to have been dropped from the conference, but I'm back. So, Bart, if you could just confirm that you can hear me. Yep, Dana, I can hear you. Okay. So, I, I got through the forecast scenarios. Did, did you get all the way up to the worst case scenario? Let's actually redo that piece right there. Okay. So, I apologize, everyone. So, we're, we're looking to draw correlations between sales stage opportunity amount, close date, and forecast category. Um, so when, when you draw these correlations, the, the pipeline forecast category should be closely correlated with sales stage. So if you've got something in the educate sales stage, it would be pretty uncommon to have it committed within your forecast, um, just based upon the historical. So when you draw these correlations, you can come up with these different forecast scenarios. So most likely would be everything that's enclosed uh, plus commit. And uh, I mentioned it before, but I'm not sure if everyone heard it, but you should have the ability to do a what-if scenario, especially for a sales operations leader sitting with the CSO. And a what-if scenario means looking at individual opportunities and moving them with, in, inside and outside of the committed number that's going to be rolled up to executives. Um, next, you would have best case, which is everything that's in commit plus closed. Uh, and then, again, with the CSO and the, and the, the senior sales operations leader, you would be able to move opportunities based upon what if to say, okay, what if this opportunity slips out? What if this one pulls in? So in the end, for as intricate as a sales forecasting process can be, it always boils down to the CSO sitting with the sales operations leader to come up with a final number uh, to, to what they're going to go forward with. And then with a uh, the worst case scenario would be everything that's closed uh, with the addition of a couple of committed opportunities, again, based upon a what if scenario. So I'll just can confirm that you guys can still hear me, and I'll, and I'll move to the next slide. Yep. So good. Bart can. Okay, good. All right. Now I want to talk about a sales process that 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 needs to be in place. So no matter no matter what tool that you are using within your within your company, it needs to be followed up with a very regimented process. And the process has a number of different elements. The first one is to have weekly forecast meetings. Some companies go to, to monthly or biweekly. The more inspection that you can give of your funnel, the more conversation that you can have between individual sellers and their managers, the more accurate it's going to get over time. So set the expectation that these are going to occur during a fixed standard or, or a fixed cadence where they, they would occur on Monday. Everybody meets throughout the, the, the day, and then they roll up their number to the CSO finally. Next, judgment. And with judgment, that's to account for some of the discrepancies of opportunity amounts or you've got salespeople that are working with sales leaders um, where sales leaders have less confidence in their forecasting ability initially, so they'll apply a, a judgment amount on top of what an individual is rolling up. So that they're applying their own judgment to change the amount, and I'll show you how that works in a minute. The next is a day one commit. That's the first commit that you – collect, sales operations should collect it using the process and the technology that they have on the, at the beginning of the forecast period. And this is the commit against which you're going to measure forecast accuracy. So if you're forecasting on a 90-day basis, on a quarterly basis, then the day one commit is going to be the first commit at the beginning of the quarter, and you're going to measure any changes against that day one commit, and then your overall forecast accuracy at the end of the period. Next is the roll-up. So from the individual, it gets rolled up to a sales manager, and it gets rolled up to the next level of management all the way until it gets to the CSO. And then finally, you've got your last or your most recent commit. So on these weekly forecast calls, you're going to collect a, a new number. Hopefully, it doesn't change from the original number, but when it does, you're going to measure that deviation, and you're going to understand why it changed and what you can do to, to try to improve it uh, going forward to, to get back to the original number. 
Now, a forecast process, a well-designed forecast process looks like this, and when you're using a tool, it needs to accommodate this process. So it starts with an individual forecast. The size of these blue boxes represents the size of the individual's commit. It's going to be a weekly forecast call or preferably a, an in-person meeting whenever possible. The manager is going to take all the feedback that they collect from that individual, and then they're going to apply their judgment based upon their knowledge of the, of the industry, their knowledge of the deals, their knowledge of the individual salesperson's ability to forecast accurately. So these, these reds and, and greens represent adjustments that the manager is going to make using, using their judgment. They're going to recalculate a number, and then they're going to roll it up uh, to, to their managers in, in another weekly forecast call. Let's just assume it's going to a VP level. And next, you'll see a negative judgment that's applied in this example. So the VP applies additional judgment. And finally, it rolls up to, to the CSO or however many levels that you have in place. And then the CSO submits it up to the executive team and does this on a weekly basis. This entire process is managed by sales operations as well as some processes and, and tools that they put in place. Now, sales operations plays a critical role in understanding and doing the analysis on the on the forecast, so keeping track of things like changes week over week, the amount of judgment that's actually applied, using external data that they might have through their own predictive algorithms or even through algorithms that they've gained through using using tools. So put this process in place. No matter what tool you're using, try to do it weekly whenever possible. So next, with reporting and analytics, here's an example of a dashboard that you could create that's going to not only improve forecast accuracy, but incorporate some predictive analytics that are available within Salesforce automation platforms indigenously. This is typically how it's done. So you've got a sales budget that, that goes across the top, or some companies call it a sales plan. Uh, so in this case, you can see that there are four different theaters, and then there, there'll be a roll-up of 27.8 million, and then you have a global number of 25 million. The reason why there's a difference between the global number and the roll-up is that there, there's over-assignment. So the, the global sales number is 25 million. That's what the CSO is going to track. The day one commit is the commit that's, that's collected at the beginning of the forecast period. So in this case, you can see it's 26.1 million. The senior sales leader, the CSO, is, has taken that number down, applying judgment by 1.1 million, and is committing to 25 million. So they're committing plan 100% of budget. It's important that you track the commit as a percentage of budget at each of these different sales levels because it holds people accountable and it gives them the bogey that they're trying to achieve. So in the follow-on calls, you're going to track the last commit in relation to that day one commit. So in this case, you can see that the, the new roll-up is 25.4 million. So it, it's come down from the 26.1 million. The sales leader, the CSO, had enough judgment where they didn't have to come off their $25 million, so they just reduced their, their judgment by uh, 700000 and, and stayed on their number of $25 million. Still, um, at 100% of commit, uh, of budget. Um, in this example, you closed $12 million worth of business. The big question always asked, and, and one that deserves an accurate answer is, are you going to make your number or are you not going to make your number? So in this example, you've got 12.9 million left to go. Now here's some valuable data that you have available to you that can be augmented with a predictive analytics solution if you choose to purchase one. Um, you look at this next slide and this, everything from the previous slide moves up and now you start to qualify that $12 million number with committed funnel ratio. So down the left-hand side, you can see all the different sales stages. They're descended in their sort. Um, so you've got a $12 million number. You've got a committed funnel um, by stage of $21.9 million. The big question is, is it good enough to have a $21.9 million number committed uh, funnel in, in comparison to what you have left to go? And that depends on where you are in the quarter. So if you're on day one of the quarter, and you've got a committed funnel coverage ratio of 1.69, you're probably in pretty good shape. Now, that's granted that you can trust the accuracy of your Salesforce uh, automation platform data, which will get better over time as you go through a, a forecast process. Uh, but if it's the last day of the quarter, it's, it's probably not as good because your coverage ratio of your most mature sales stages, those are the ones that are most probable to, to close within the, the last few days of the quarter, is only 0.008. 
And if you combine your, your top two sales stages, you've only got a coverage ratio of 0.62. So if you start to collect this data, or if you're using a tool that collects this data for you, at least snapshots it on a weekly, maybe even a daily basis, you can start to gauge the health of your funnel in comparison to what your, your to-go number is. So to recap, ensure that these forecast foundations are in place. Make sure that you have a regimented forecast process that, that, that's also in place, one that follows the different principles that, that we outlined in the previous slide, and then follow it up with some really good metrics that are going to give you some predictive um, ideas as to whether or not you're going to achieve your numbers or not. So here's a, here's a dashboard that we help to design for a customer. It employs all these different principles that I just talked about. On the top left-hand side, it just basically tells you where the organization is, in general against all the key, the key metrics. On the bottom left-hand side, it gives you all of your different coverage ratios. In, in this case, they wanted to see total coverage ratio plus committed coverage ratio. Top right-hand side, it adds an additional element that shows you where you are year over year and quarter over quarter on the same day uh, to give you another indication of whether you're, you're trending positively or not. And then on the lower right-hand side, it gives you a summary of deals that are committed, deals that have closed, now, in companies that we've seen share this information or make it available at least on a daily basis, we see greater adoption within the Salesforce automation platform because people are now tracking these, these, these metrics. We also see acceleration in sales because they know exactly what's left for their organization to achieve. They know how much time they have left to achieve it, and it just keeps the pressure on time-wise for, for companies to, to, to achieve that number. Predictive analytics. Now, our view on predictive analytics is the time has come for predictive analytics solutions to be in place. Many companies are struggling with whether or not they should, they should purchase one today or not. One thing that you should know that predictive analytics solutions learn over time. So the sooner you purchase one, the more time you're giving these solutions to learn from the interaction with your data. So if you, if you buy one today, two years from now, it's going to be a lot smarter than it would be if you waited two years to, to purchase it. Now, Really, when you think about what predictive analytics solutions can, can offer and, and if it's going to be accurate, why would you continue to rely on intuition alone, knowing that intuition has really failed us over the last 30 years when it comes to forecasting? Ever since Salesforce automation platforms have gotten, gotten into place, we've tried to forecast more accurately, and we've failed measurably at it. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at a predictive analytics solution, when you buy one, don't use it as an interrogation tool. What you should use it as is just like a third point of reference to say, okay, your sales management, is, this is their view of the opportunities that you're forecasting. Your sales reps have another view. Your predictive solution has another view. And as you start to get more confidence in your predictive solution, you're probably going to rely more on the predictive algorithm to, to help you in your forecasting, but it's going to take some time before that happens. So don't use it as an interrogation tool. Do use it as a third point of triangulation that's going to get smarter and improve over time. When you're choosing a predictive analytics solution, here's some things that you should keep in mind. Make sure that it manages the forecast process that I just went through in those previous slides. So make sure that it submits with a timestamp. There are short Salesforce automation platforms out there that don't have that timestamp. And the reason why the timestamp is important when you're uh, preparing a forecast is you want to know that this is the number that the individual actually decided to go forward with not one that was just arbitrarily taken from the system based upon a point in time. Make sure that you can apply judgment because uh, your sales leadership is going to want to do that as they get more comfortable with a predictive solution. Make sure that there's a roll-up functionality, that it records changes. And also, as I went through these different forecast scenarios, in the end, your sales leaders and your, and your sales operations leaders are going to want to apply their own what-if analysis, moving opportunities in and out to see what's going to happen to the overall forecast. Make sure that it has robust reporting so that it, re it, it produces all these different reports that I just went through. Also, a very common question that we see across our customers is in, in the end of the forecast period, everybody wants to know if you made your number, what changed from the beginning of the, of the period. They especially want to know what changed if you miss your number. So wh why did you miss your number? Was it because you had opportunities slip? Is it because they changed in value? Is, is it because you had opportunities get pulled in? So a robust forecasting and predictive analytics solution will provide that answer automatically and it will do it in real time. Also, it will snapshot your data so that you can see year over year results, quarter over quarter results, and it will also help you produce those why explanations to say here's why we made our number or here's why we did not make our number.
Lastly, when you're evaluating a predictive analytics solution, ask the vendor to prove their, the, the accuracy of their, of their algorithms. The easiest way to do that is to ask them what the R value is. And there's probably some more more advanced analytics uh, methodologies that you can use for, for, for the data scientists that are out there in the audience right now. But the most basic way to do is, is do the R value. So just think of the R value as predicting the, the correlation between the data that you're using and the, the end result, which would be your, your forecast or your actuals. It, it runs on a scale from zero to, to one. The closer it is to one, the more accurate it is. It starts to become accurate around 0.6. So talk to your vendor, ask them where they are in terms of accuracy, and ask them to prove that out for you. So when it comes to improving forecast accuracy, sales leaders, we, we advise them to create a culture where forecast rigor is expected. Put that process in place. Make sure that your, your teams are adhering to it on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, however frequently as you do it. Again, we recommend weekly. Um, when you're talking about forecast data, only use data that's visible in the Salesforce automation platform. The mantra that we encourage people to use is, if it's not in the Salesforce automation platform, it doesn't exist. So that discourages the use of spreadsheets outside of the system. Eventually, everybody will put all their opportunities in the system and will get more accurate over time. But sales operations, go back and inspect to ensure that you've got those different foundations in place. It's your responsibility to manage that weekly forecast process. It's also your responsibility to go out there and evaluate solutions that are going to improve forecast accuracy, whether it be through the, the Salesforce automation platform that you're using today or whether it's through a, a, a third-party tool that you're considering in the, in the future. And then really, you have to be the, the chief advisor to the CSO in improving forecast accuracy. So using the data that you have available to you, um, coaching the, the, the CSO based upon the knowledge that you have, it's, it's your overall responsibility to be driving accuracy throughout the, the, the system. But we get this question a lot around channel sales. Is should, should channels be producing a forecast in addition to the direct sales force? And the answer is yes. Uh, they, they should be creating their own view of a forecast based upon their knowledge of what's transpiring inside the channel and within the distributor network. And then they should be correlating the, that information and coordinating back with the direct sales force. So those are the primary uh, responsibilities of these three different titles. Um, within within the sales organization. And lastly, for anyone that's a uh, serious decisions customer, we've got research that supports everything that I've provided in the in the presentation today. And here's a list of it. Um, or if you just want to inquire about it, you can always contact us and, and we can share some of this information with you. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Ivan. Dana, that was fantastic. Um, there were so many points that you raised up that uh, tie back into things that I want to cover that I'm, uh, I'm giddy. Um, but we're only going to take just a couple of minutes here to talk about on the back end kind of what we do, and, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So we could not agree more that forecasting is an art and a science. And when it's done best, it includes that human judgment inputs, like you said, but it's really based on data and a highly tuned algorithm that's unique to each organization to help them really look at their sales methodology and then make the most of it. The inside sales portfolio has a number of products that are geared from helping people sell from the top of the funnel with lead scoring all the way down to the bottom in forecasting, ultimately trying to make sales superheroes. So that includes everything from email and web engagement tools that the sales rep controls to sales communication tools designed to help the sales rep and field rep get more contacts, and then sales gamification motivation. But this is a forecasting webinar, so let's talk about the, the sales tools and how they help individual sales reps, sales management, sales ops, and even the CFO office. Okay. We're going to come back, we're going to come back to, that, um, to that idea about the platform um, at the end here. But this is really, you know, where some of the most basic questions are. How much should I get in book? Which deals will close? And for the individual sales rep, what's my next best, act, my next best action? In a recent survey I saw, uh, the question was asked, who in the C-suite is a person you like to meet with the least? I assumed it was going to be the CEO, but it was actually the CFO. And when they dove down, the answer was poor forecasting. 
And the CFO, obviously, is ultimately responsible for that. So that CFO is really, he or she is really pounding on the sales ops and salespeople to really get that right. You mentioned that the idea of, of over and under is important. You're completely right. In today's day, today's day and age of real-time manufacturing and delivering, under forecasting is just as important because they, that means they don't have enough wheels or gadgets or whatever to make the products that they're supposed to be making to then um, deliver on time, ultimately resulting in a, in a poor customer experience. So under forecasting can be just as much of a problem as over forecasting. At inside sales, you see that, that, that area in the middle, that high definition data. We believe that science is really the key. And at our heart, we're really a science and data company. We have about 100 billion sales interactions, all housed within a CRM. That's a system of record that we use as a foundation for all of our judgments. So before we take a quick look at the products, let's take a quick look at the results. This actually came from one of our customers. Um, they uh, purchased our product, and over the course of about a year, they trended it and then came back to us and showed it to us. And what you see is a 90-day sales cycle on the bottom, so it starts with 90 days out and then ends 10 days out, and then the accuracy on the left. So the blue line that you see was what their reps had forecasted on day 90, on day 80, on day 70. And then the green line at the top is what we had predicted their uh, forecast, what their end-of-quarter forecast would be. So on day one, we predicted with about 82% accuracy what their forecast would be at the end of the quarter. You know, we, we don't have that last box in there from day 10 to day zero, but obviously that's where they, they come together and merge. But think about the difference, that delta you see there, that light blue shaded box, that's the delta in planning for those two or three, uh, several weeks at the beginning of the quarter, even the first two months, where the CEO, the CFO, other C-level people are planning with very poor data. Those include hiring decisions, firing decisions, whether they can bring in new software, whether they can expand into new markets. All those things are hampered by having a poor, a poor forecast. So how did we get here? We'll talk about uh, three quick tools. I think we had a quick, huh, my pa okay. You should be seeing a slide now that says sales advisor. I think we had another little glitch there, jump us to the end. So this is the first tool that we use, and this tool is for the individual sales rep. It allows that rep to prioritize the deals that are best for them in that quarter and then commit with confidence and then ultimately gives them actions that they can do that will help prescribe what are going to be the best thing? So you see there, this is an individual deal that they're looking at with Enlightening. This is a very likely deal that they're going to win, but it's actually not as likely. Only It's likely to win this quarter, but not as uh, – it's very likely they will win the deal eventually, but only likely that they're going to win it this quarter. But then we give you some – positive and negative indicators of why this is going to happen. This may include things like the number of times this is already pushed. This may include things like an email. So going back to that, uh, to the platform, we talked about email and web uh, engagement tracking. So where this comes back into here is maybe the sales rep sent off a pricing proposal um, to, to an account. They have never opened up that proposal. The system understands that that proposal has never been opened. That's going to be a negative indicator that this deal is unlikely to close because regardless of what that person is saying on the phone to you, they've never actually opened that, that uh, proposal and scanned it. Or maybe it's a very large deal and you're dealing with the director level person. That email has never been forwarded to a VP or to a sales officer, someone who actually has purchasing authority. Being able to understand what's happening with that email and other traffic, all that data comes back into the system and then ultimately helps advise the forecasting tool. So the, those indicators you see on the right, those are positive and negative indicators from the machine, the algorithm, the machine learning that's unique to your organization that helps you as an organization move forward. That's what that is there, separate from the judgment. Next piece is around that pipeline management. And like he said, the ability to go back and have what-if scenarios, um, understanding if you had to change these boundaries or if you had to move people around, if you had to change quota, how would that pipeline be affected today or going back 
you know, a year ago and seeing how if things had moved, how would it change that pipeline or even tomorrow? You know, how many times have, have people had a committed forecast of, or, or pipeline of, you know, $6 million, and then by Monday it's down to, forty you know, $4.5 million. What actually happened over the weekend? What deals were shrunk? What deals were closed? What new deals were in there? All that, understanding that very graphically and easily for everyone from the individual rep up through management. And then lastly, the actual forecast itself. Improving uh, forecast accuracy by combining both the judgments and the predictions that the, that the system understands. This one I'm going to go into a little bit more a clear example. So this is what you typically have. Um, once again, this is at the bottom. You have the uh, weeks of the quarter, and then that orange area is a committed amount from the sales rep. So first you have a commit level from them. That, that yellow line at the top is your quota that you have to attain. The system goes in and looks at what is the upside here? What are the deals that are actually potential to be pulled in based upon the information that is pulled into the CRM from all types of internal and external data? So it's showing you the upside that maybe your sales reps have either sandbagged on or just point blank didn't even realize it was there. It also looks at those deals that they that are committed and says what is the risk associated with every single one of these deals and gives you the ability to click down into the individual deals and say okay what are the factors that may make this uh, not actually happen or not actually happen on time and then ultimately giving you a predictive forecast that takes into account what the sales team has committed what the commit risk is involved with that what the potential upside of deals that aren't being worked right now and then the other external data to ultimately give you a forecast that you can use today to predict from 90 days out. That's kind of a highlight about uh, the, the uh, services that we provide or the solution that we provide. Dana, I think the things that you covered are, were great tools for people to learn how to use the product. We've, uh, we have a couple of, of the behinds that we'd like to offer to you. The first one is becoming a sales organization, how to becoming a predictive sales organization, and the best practices around building that forecasting. And then what you saw on the previous slide was another was another uh, piece that we provided uh, some new research that we've done. Um, it's more of a general piece, but it has a lot of insight, um, and so I wanted to provide it to you guys as well. That was a a piece that was just commissioned, I believe we released that about a month and a half ago, over 5 million opportunities analyzed and about 580 uh, leaders surveyed as part of that. So with that, I'd like to open it up for a little Q&A. And Dana, if you can come back on the line, we'll go from there. I'm back, Ivan. All right. We have first question that comes in. How big does an organization need to be to benefit from a predictive forecasting tool? Um, I'll start with that, and then I'll throw it over to you, Dana, if you have something you want to add. You know, okay. we've helped organizations that have hundreds or actually thousands of uh, sales reps, but we've actually helped organizations down to around the 25 to 30 sales reps. Really what's most important is do you have uh, how complex – is the sales cycle you're working in? Um, how complex is the product in, in types of uh, environments you, you sell into, whether the international, international and multi-currency, other things like that? And then how much data do you have? Um, we, uh, as part of how we do our forecasting, we typically help organizations wrangle their data and get a, a better uh, handle of whether it's in Microsoft Dynamics or in Salesforce, trying to help them clean that data so it could be used. But really that data is critical. So if you don't have a good footprint of data today, that doesn't mean you don't start. That means you, you buy the product, you understand it's a ramp-up period, and, you, and then you start clean with the right data from the beginning. So your thoughts on that, there, uh, Dana? Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Ivan. And then we, we see – Companies of all sizes focused on improving forecast accuracy, and it's primarily driven because of accountability to stakeholders, and especially with those companies that are owned by VCs and private equities. Um, we were talking to a private equity company that manages a portfolio of companies, and they, they were evaluating 
a potential purchase, and the, the, their potential purchase as they were reviewing it, they, they missed their forecast a number of different times, and they just eventually pulled out of the deal because they just felt as though – it was, it was a fairly small company, but they, they just felt as though they didn't have enough management rigor and discipline in place. So it's not a matter of size. It's a matter of, of, of how important it is for you to get it right because the, the issues of inaccuracy occur at, in every size company. The issue of over-reliance on intuition exists no matter how many reps you have. So it's not like if you're smaller, you're going to be more accurate at it. At it. You're still going to have the same problems. And you, you're not going to be the same size forever. So better to start when you're small uh, with a predictive solution and, and, and have it learn as you get bigger. All right. That's a great question. You know, and you're completely right. It really boils down to how accurate do you need to be. Um, the next question is, how accurate are these systems? Am I going to experience a 20, 30, 40? You know, what level of growth am I going to uh, – uh, what level of accuracy am I going to gain? You know, this, this is a great question that we get all the time, and it, it's, it's kind of funny because some people tend to come with, well, if you're not 99% accurate, then why would I use you at all? And while um, on many of our pro uh, products we do tend to be in the high 80s or low 90s in accuracy, the, the funny thing is most organizations would, would have great results even if they had a 5 to 20% change in their accuracy. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting that organizations um, kind of give themselves a pass on, on their level of accuracy, and then they want a, a, a exponentially higher when, they, when they're looking to uh, outsource it or bring in tools rather that help. Um, the organizations that we've seen on average, like I say, get around in the high 80s, but I've seen organizations, very large organizations, only get maybe a 10% increase in their sales volume, but because of the size of the company, it was still quite important. And with, with us, Ivan, we, you know, like we haven't done a study to say, well, what, what was your forecast accuracy pre-predictive analytics and what was it post-predictive uh, analytics? Just to the customers that we've worked with, the ones that have adopted the solutions, they've seen an immediate in, improvement like, you know, by 10 to 15 percent. Um, so I, I don't have a benchmark survey to, to give you any specific numbers. And we're still sort of at the, at the emergence of predictive analytics. Um, but anecdotally, the, the ones that are using it are getting more are getting more accurate. And I, I, my, my view of it is th there's going to be leaders in this space, and there'll be laggards in it, and then the, the, the laggards will be the ones that are struggling to catch up. Yep. So the last question we have right now: um, What would be the criteria for a what if uh, what if analysis? Shouldn't the sales process handle the predictability, barring the sales process is solid? So, um, great question. So in our organizations or in previous ones I've been in, there's, there's typically times when sales leaders want to go back and say, okay, if I change this geography, how would that affect my pipeline? Would I need more reps or less reps? Or would I have to increase their quota? Or would it be the same? Those are the types of, there's all types of what-if scenarios that you can have looking historically, looking at your current sales organization, or looking in the future where having a tool that's based on data really helps you, uh, helps you do that analysis. Along with that, um, many times in the what-if, we're able to see if, we're, if we were to change the deal as well, and um, as far as, Increase the size of the deal along with the, um, with the discounts. All that can be part of the what-if scenarios. If we were to aggregate these multiple deals, maybe you're dealing with a, a company that has um, several subsidiaries underneath it. Bringing the ability to have what-if scenarios about whether you want to work with those individually or a larger as a, as a larger whole. All those are different types of what-if scenarios that a good forecasting tool should be able to help you analyze. Yeah, and when I was talking about what if the scenario or the um, you know, the scenario that I use a lot is that you've got a CSO sitting in the room with the, with the senior sales operations leader the morning before they're going to present to the to the executive team what the forecast is going to be for the quarter. Now, the, the forecast is going to be based upon the roll-ups of the individuals, the judgment that's been applied at all different levels. Um, but let's just say, for example, and this this happens all the time. 
that there's a it's a ten million dollar forecast and there's a million dollar deal that the predictive solution said is going to happen. Everyone in the management chain said it's going to happen, but the morning that you're sitting to prepare the final forecast, you learn that there was the person that was supposed to sign the deal had a family emergency is not available and can't sign the deal. So no matter how good a predictive analytics solution is, or you know how confident a rep is or managers are in their ability to forecast, occasionally things like that happen. And you need the ability to go in there and quickly make those types of changes and, and move it around and say, okay, this million dollar deal is going to going to slip out. What, what can I try to pull in? What can where can I do some some extraordinary acts to 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 try to cover it? So you you need to be able to move those around at, at the eleventh hour, and, and that's really where the primary importance of, of what if comes. Yeah, great, great. I'm glad you added, Dana. That was that was actually spot on. Uh, one more that came across. If an organization starts when they are very immature, is there a risk of using bad data to start the analytics process? Well, if you're small and immature and you have bad data, I am 100% confident that as you grow and you get big, you will only have worse data. Because if you start with a bad practice, that practice only grows and amplifies. So now is actually the time to have someone come in, help you understand the best way to structure your data to make to meet your forecasting objectives. But no, I would not wait until you're a larger, more mature organization that has those practices really inculcated into the system. And I'll, I'll add to that, Ivan. So the, the the coverage ratio example that I showed you during the, the presentation, if you've never used these before, if you've had poor Salesforce automation platform uh, adoption, I guarantee you that the, the first month that you use these coverage ratios, they're going to be completely out of whack. So you, you might go in with a coverage ratio of a thousand percent, and what, what it does is uh, it, it prompts questions and it and starts to show people that. Look, all this time that you're spending putting all this information in the system, we're actually using this data. And what you're telling me here is that you have a thousand percent coverage ratio. So either you're gonna you're gonna up up your commit, or you're going to fix the quality of your data. Which is it? And generally, they opt for fixing the quality of their data. So no matter what solution you put in place, you're gonna have data quality issues when you when you first start. But as you start to inspect and use the data, it's just gonna get better over time. And really, using this data, even when it's poor quality, it forces the issue and it makes the, the cleanup happen that much faster. Dana, you've done a great job today showing us how improving the sales uh, forecasting process helps everyone from the individual sales rep all the way up through the CFO office, how it's really everybody's job ultimately because the organization lives and dies off of that ability to plan. I personally want to thank you. This has been a great uh, webinar, and I appreciate the content. And uh, if anyone has any questions, please reach, reach out to Dana or myself, and we look forward to having you on a future webinar. Thank you, Ivan. Take care.